Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us here, the International Franchise Association Black Franchise Leadership Council. My name is Richard Snow. I'm the chair for the Black Franchise Leadership Council. And on this historic Juneteenth Day, we are honored once again to put together this program to go through and speak through the historical reference of Juneteenth, but also be inspired by the entrepreneurs, Black entrepreneurs within the franchising space, continuing to make a difference, continuing to have their voices heard, and continue to, continuing to create community. We think it's important to continue to highlight this because during that time in Texas, it were building and developing community and liberating themselves at the same time. So we're gonna hear truths from the past and understand how those truths tether together and those same examples in that same spirit of liberation continues to live on today. So I'm glad that you joined us here and a part of this discussion and dialogue. I'm honored to work with these amazing leaders, servant leaders. That's what we all are, servant leaders. We continue to serve in all we do. We put our morals, values, and God first in our walk. And we're glad that you're here with us to make this difference, to close this generational gap, to bring more entrepreneurs within to the space of franchising. That's what drives us and that's what continues to push us to do what we do. So thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna step out of the way and hand it over to Carolyn Thurston for her opening remarks so we can begin this amazing program about this historic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, my name is Carolyn Thurston and I'm the founder and CEO of Wisdom Senior Care. I'm the vice chair of the Black Franchise Leadership Council and I'm so excited and can't wait to hear all of our speakers today. As Richard stated, History is so important, and it's so important to help build upon that. And in order for us to be able to create that general generational wealth, it's important for us to understand what our true roots were, how things were built, what did our forefathers do. So it's like stepping stones. And you, I'm so proud of each person that's here today because you are really taking first steps to educate yourself. So congratulations and let's move forward. Richard. Thank you, Carolyn, for that. I'm Ursa Jackson. I am the chair of the IFA Diversity Institute. Uh, I'm also a partner at the law firm of Clark Hill in the Dallas office where I head up the firm's franchise team. I greet you on behalf of all of IFA. Welcome to our session. We've got a great program for you. As I thought about the inspiration um, and thought about Juneteenth, I'm not going to steal Charles's uh, glory uh, as he's going to tell you more about uh, Juneteenth, but I wanted to grab something that the uh, Major General Granger uh, posted in a proclamation back on the 1st June 19th uh, because it's apropos to what we're talking about today. On this posting that was posted all around Galveston uh, when the slaves were freed is a statement that I want to leave you with. After the, after the statement that they were free, it said in this proclamation, this involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property. We are still chasing that equality today. That's why we are here. That's what drives us. So as you ponder the thoughts that are shared today, ask yourself, how can you help us continue that quest for equality? Thank you. Excellent. And, um, so before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker tip for today, who's going to provide an amazing historical reference of Juneteenth. His name is Charles O'Neill. Charles is the Texas Association African American Chamber of Commerce Board of Director. He's charged with carrying out the mission of the nation's premier statewide Black Chamber of Commerce with experience in business development, strategic communication, and organizational development. O'Neill is charged with moving the concerns of Texas 250,000 plus Black owned businesses to the top of private and public sector procurement opportunities, foster relationships that positively impact 
local black chambers and advocate for legislation that results in improved quality of life for black Texans. O'Neill has provided consultative services to a range of companies and organizations on the local, state, and national levels. From framing messages to developing strategies for business growth, O'Neill has earned the trust of his clients and helped lead them to successful, profitable outcomes in the marketplace. From the service as chair of the board of the U.S. Black Chambers to successfully shepherding the legislative agenda of the Texas Association of African American Chamber of Commerce through the Texas Legislator Service uh, on the Sustainable Energy Advisory Board of Energy, Future Holdings, to conducting outreach for municipal bond elections, O'Neill has been entrusted with messages that result in improvement in the lives of Black Americans. In addition to serving as the as president of the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce June 2010 through December 2011, providing exemplary leadership for the nation's oldest and largest African-American Chamber of Commerce, O'Neill also served 14 years as the DBCC Vice President for Business and Economic Development, a nearly 20-year award-winning career in the newspaper business provide the backdrop for O'Neill's insight into the inner workings of our city, state, and nation, and helped inform credible opinions on the entire spectrum of the African-American experience. So Charles, I thank you today for setting the tone and giving us the historical reference of Juneteenth. I give to you, Charles O'Neill. All right, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, uh, man, it's just quite an honor, number one, to be with you today. Uh, I cannot uh, begin this short, short, short discourse uh, without saying one thank you to my fraternity brother, Brother Snow, and to David Smith, who uh, he and I worked together at went during his time at the U.S. Black Chambers. And so uh, I salute you and the uh, IFA Black Leadership Council uh, for, one, this forum and for inviting me to participate in this monumental program. Um, I, I have to admit that um, I'm a bit chauvinistic. I'm a native Texan. I'm a bit chauvinistic about uh, Juneteenth and its origin. Uh, uh, it is a uniquely Texas uh, commemoration rather than celebration uh, of a very, very difficult time in the lives of Black folk in America. Among my earliest memories, uh, as noted, I am a native Texan, uh, I guess three or four years old, um, my grandparents uh, lived in Corpus Christi, Texas. If you're familiar at all with Texas, Texas Corpus Christi is a coastal city uh, on the Gulf of Mexico. And again, among my earliest memories of of Juneteenth is everybody loading up the cars and being in the big wash tubs full of ice and soft drinks for the children and other beverages for the adults and digging fire pits to do barbecue on Padre Island. And and what 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 really struck me about remembering that experience was we went out on the evening of June 18th, so that looking out on the horizon, facing the rising sun of a new day begun, June 19th. So we all woke up looking at this amazing horizon of this new day begun. And so that's that's my earliest memory of Juneteenth. And so it is a special day for me as a special day for Black Texans. And we know that uh, it's widespread um, uh, commemoration across the nation, across the world actually, is because of the dispersal of Black Texans following emancipation. And so when Black folk moved up South and moved out West and moved back up to the East Coast, uh, they took those traditions with them as well. And so it has become 
what now has manifested itself in a national holiday, a national observance of this deal. I don't think there, though, is a way to fully appreciate or understand the Juneteenth phenomenon without supplying historical context. You heard that I was in the newspaper business. I got opinions about everything, right? And But the most important thing that I bring with me from my experience in the newspaper business is how critical it is that Black folk, that is us, control messaging, control the conversation, the narrative about what our experience is and how it should be uh, made known to the rest of the world. And so providing historical context from our perspective, I think is important. I'm concerned a bit about the national holiday because it gets, it would, if past this prologue, it'll get mushed into this soft, easy focus on just the emancipation without ever considering what we're being emancipated from. So we cannot, cannot forget the brutality of chattel slavery. We can't forget the fact that Black folk were, in fact, in the case of Juneteenth, um, denied the knowledge of the Emancipation Proclamation having been issued actually in September of 62, uh, but made uh, effective January 1st of 1863. So two and a half years later, this occasion arises in, in Texas. So I tried to do my best in the time allotted to me today, so just hold on. Uh, we got to go back, I think, at least 40 years before June 19th, 1865. Spain then owned what is called Mexico or New Spain. Uh, Moses Austin from Connecticut uh, dreamed up a scheme that would grant him land in exchange for trade concessions if he would bring people to settle the wilderness of Texas, Mexico. Moses Austin died before his dream scheme could bear fruit, but he convinced his son, Stephen F. Austin, glorified as the father of Texas, to complete the project. But the terms of the original deal had changed because Mexico had broken free from Spain. So a new deal had to be brokered between Stephen Austin and Iturbide, the new president of Mexico, the new nation of Mexico. That didn't even last long either because the second president of the new country of Mexico, a black man named Vicente Guerrero, decreed in 1829 that slavery was illegal in Mexico. The 300 families that Moses and Stephen Austin brought to Texas to settle the wilderness owned slaves. Meanwhile, back in the US, there was a constant fight over manifest destiny. The white goal of expanding West and creating new states along the way. And slavers wanted to ensure that any new states would be slave states. There were, as I noted, enslavers among those moving to Texas, and they were not happy over the Mexican decree against slavery. So they started a fight that resulted in the formation of the Republic of Texas. You've all heard of the Alamo. Yeah. That fight was over white enslavers' right to keep black people in bondage. White cotton and sugar planters flocked to the new country of Texas, lured by free land and the freedom to work black people to death for their profit. The war with Mexico, however, had devastated the, the, the treasury of the Republic of Texas, so the new country appealed to the US and was an annexed by the US becoming the 28th state, a slave state. By the time the uncivil war erupted in 1861, Texas now teeming with scores of white people attracted to the lure of King Cotton succeeded with the rest of the Cotton South. As the war progressed and Confederate losses mounted, slaveholders began moving their property west to Texas. Over the course of the war, the black population of Texas ballooned. And here's the first part of the missing context. These black people actually talked to each other. Those newcomers told the Texas black folk 
that the Emancipation Proclamation had been issued in 1863. They knew that the reason they were still enslaved was because white folks refused to give up the ghost of their dreams of slavery forever. But when Lee and Jeff Davis finally gave it up in April of 1865, white folks in Texas were still hanging on to their lost cause until U.S. Grant sent Gordon Granger and 2,000 Black Union soldiers to Galveston to let them know that the jig was up. Slavery was done in Texas. Boom. June 19, 1865, General Order Number 3 was issued, alerting white folks that slavery was done. And another part of the missing context but also that the newly freed black folks should stay on the plantations and now work for wages. And I know that's a lot to digest in a short time, but it kind of brings us to today's conversation with IFA. How so, you ask? Because bright and early on June 20th, 1865, black people, turned into entrepreneurs. Now we could trade our labor for money. Clearly it is, has not and was not and is not a, a smooth transition, but the birth of black business after the uncivil war can be traced directly to Juneteenth. About eight years ago now, on the 150th anniversary of the Juneteenth, uh, uh, decree, uh, the Texas Association of African American Chambers of Commerce uh, hosted an event at the Texas Capitol uh, entitled From Galveston to Greatness. And it was the, expressly to highlight the fact that yes, June 19th was the occasion, but that again, on June 20th, our lives changed dramatically from that point forward. And we began a, a, a period of brick making and lumberjacking and railroad building and, and house building and plumbing and all of those skills now that manifested themselves in our entry into entrepreneurism. And so while, while in fact, um, this national attention focused on uh, the observance of the Juneteenth uh, commemoration is, it is critical to expanding uh, understanding of uh, one, the black presence in America, but certainly uh, the lives of uh, the way that chattel slavery uh, shaped the American consciousness. Uh, and in fact, today uh, still impacts us, uh, uh, the national pathology around race issues. Um, we're still struggling with that. That's why, again, I, I, I constantly harp on, on, on us being able to tell stories in our terms, from our perspective, from our experience, rather than the whitewashed versions of history that we have all grown up with. Um, we know today Texas now has the largest black population among the 50 states. I think that's important. I think um, that the presence of black folk in Texas uh, will ultimately be a bellwether for what happens across the rest of the nation. Uh, we know, and if you paid attention at all, you know that uh, our governor and the governor of Florida are in this mad race for who can be the wildest, uh, who can do the most damage to uh, the populations that are most impacted by their negative uh, in Texas, uh, they're changing uh, public school curriculum, uh, just recently passed uh, a law against uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, departments and programs in public institutions, colleges, and universities uh, that extended to um, uh, employment and admissions into those institutions. Uh, we defeated a, 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 a bill proposed this past legislation that would have included um, contracting opportunities for uh, without reference to uh, aggrieved classes, black folk, brown folk, Asian Americans, Native Americans. Um, 
we were able to get that expunged from those those pieces of legislation that did make it to the governor's desk this year, we don't doubt that it will be um, revived in upcoming legislative sessions. So know that um, there are people who believe that was a good piece of legislation. Again, from our perspective, we know it would have been devastating to uh, the opportunities for the largest black population in the nation to receive a taxpayer uh, or return on their taxpayer investment in terms of contracting opportunities from the state of Texas. The state of Texas spends half a trillion dollars a year in goods and services, employment and other opportunities uh, for a state, uh, again, that has about 15% of its population, black folk, Black folk earn, this is a rounding error, manage somehow to earn 1% of the state's spending for goods and services. And so uh, understand again that um, without our constant attention focused on the very unique challenges faced by Black owned businesses, um, I, I think that we'll be in for a bumpy ride. But but, but back to Galveston to greatness, the observance of Juneteenth and the connection to IFA's Black Leadership Council's F act, 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 activities and effort. We're especially proud in Texas of, or particularly here in Dallas, of uh, Williams Chicken, who all you all know, Hiawatha Williams is, you know, he's the godfather. Uh, Three years ago, we were able to, as an organization, induct uh, Hiawatha Williams and uh, Percy Cruzo, French's Chicken in Houston, uh, into the Texas Black Business Hall of Fame. Both of those uh, franchise opportunities um, are big business here in the state of Texas and the great examples of what can be accomplished when the right combinations of support from organizations like IFA, um, its insistence on uh, ease of access to um, financing opportunities, to access to capital, which continues to bedevil all enterprises, not just uh, franchise opportunities, of course, but uh, it is the actions, uh, the mission, uh, the insistence, again, of IFA's Black Leadership Council uh, to expand those opportunities that are going to uh, ensure uh, that the future of Black business continues to bright, to be bright, uh, to be hopeful and optimistic. Um, we believe that uh, the lessons learned from Juneteenth brought forward to today will result in a new awareness, not only of um, the role that our ancestors played in ensuring that we arrive at a point like we are today, where we can celebrate successes in business, where we can, uh, again, have expectations that can be realized in future opportunities. But again, it is the work of organizations like those that I represent, uh, Black Chambers of Commerce, and friendly um, professional organizations uh, like uh, International Franchise Association, that again, uh, support the growth development expansion of black owned businesses. Uh, we think that this national observance of Juneteenth uh, will add impetus to our efforts. And we hope that providing context at all levels uh, that our unique experiences are continue to be the driving force for our future activity. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope I, if we're going to have time for questions, I'd love to I'd love to engage in a dialogue. But but that's what I think about Juneteenth. It's ours uniquely. It's our it's our holiday. We should ac absolutely acknowledge uh, the role that it has played in form that has played in forming one our, our uh, understanding of uh, the bondage of chattel slavery, but the hopefulness of uh, being uh, the wellspring of black business ownership in the US. Charles, thank you. That that was absolutely powerful. And, and takeaway, some of the key points I took away was the end of slavery 
was the beginning of entrepreneurship for our people. You know, being able to give thanks to our ancestors and keeping our eyes on the prize with some of the points you mentioned. And then the lesson learned, the lessons learned will result in a new awareness, that continued new awareness. So thank you, my brother, for delivering that truth with enthusiasm and continuing to be the shoulders that we stand upon to continue to move this forward for the generations to come. And I thank you for um, offering your time and your treasure and your knowledge as a vessel to us here today. So thank you for the words. We will reserve questions towards the end just because we have a jam-packed agenda. So I'm gonna continue this presentation and moving forward with our fireside chat, which will be moderated by my friend, committee chair for the IFA, the um, communication chair for the IFA Black Franchise Leadership Council, Nancy Williams. After 14 years managing customer care and sales support for teams in the wireless industry, Nancy Williams launched Invaluable Franchise Consulting Incorporated in 2015. Her firm specializes in assisting women and people of color in identifying great franchise investment opportunities for themselves and their families. Recently, she took on a consulting role at Ben & Jerry's, heading up the franchise development and promoted her new racial equity ownership program, which you'll hear a little bit more about today in our program. Combining her passion for entrepreneurship with her love of writing, she's an amazing writer, um, became, a, became a content contributor for Black Enterprise Magazine in 2016, a staff writer for the Franchise Dictionary Magazine in 2019, sharing both enlightening and inspiring stories about franchise success stories in the world. In 2020, she purchased and launched Money Pages Franchise, becoming the first franchise owner in California. We are grateful to have Nancy chair the Community Partnership Committee for the Black Franchise Leadership Council and excited she's here with us today to moderate our fireside chat. So without further ado, I hand it over to Nancy Williams. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, really appreciate all the kind words. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is one of my favorite times of year uh, and I love doing the program. I'm honored to be part of the Black Franchise Leadership Council. I really enjoy chairing the community partnerships and um, you know what better way to celebrate Juneteenth than talking about inspiring, empowering and transforming people through franchising. I'm really excited because we have two powerful women today uh, that I'm going to be uh, interviewing and talking to about their success in franchising. Um, they, they both um, own and represent some powerful and exciting brands. And um, that's, you know, let's, uh, you know, my passion is to get a lot of uh, a lot of us, particularly women into franchise ownership. Um, but we know that we need many more people of color and faces representing. Uh, we've got a lot of um, talent to bring to franchising and you'll you'll learn a little bit more today about uh two women that are doing just that so let me start by um reading their their bios and welcoming them our our first uh, speaker is darcel stewart darcel is president and owner of five ups store franchise locations in the atlanta metro area um, Darcel has experienced 14 years of successful operations after acquiring her first store in 2009. Prior to her entrepreneurial endeavors, Darcel held various corporate finance and accounting positions spanning 25 plus year period to include companies such as CNN, The Boeing Company, and Motorola. Of course, my phone would ring. <laughs> she has received recent honors from the Atlanta Business Journal, um, Atlanta's, Atlanta Business League, uh, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, also nominated for an Entrepreneur uh, Award um, from the UPS Store Corporate Group, selected from owners representing more than 6,000 locations nationwide. Darcel holds an MBA in finance from the University of Chicago uh, Booth School of Business, a BS in accounting from Wharton, and is a certified public accountant. 
Her involvement in the community and professional associations include being a lifetime member of the National Black MBA Association, the Douglas County Chamber, past president of the Windy City chapter of Jack and Jill, and, um, and an active member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Welcome, Darcel, and thank you for being here today. I told you we've got some powerful folks today. <laughs> Next up is Adina Bio, uh, who um, owns uh, four IHOP franchises in the northern New Jersey area. She opened her first location in Irvington, New Jersey at the age of 27, making her one of the youngest franchisees in the country and the second largest employer in the township. Bio is, a, uh, is the founder of Cornbread, a fast casual farm to table soul food restaurant um, with two locations and recently launched her latest restaurant concept, Urban Vegan. Adina is a successful real estate developer with a portfolio of several major residential and mixed use urban redevelopment projects across Northern Virginia. Adina also sits on the prestigious Federal Reserve Bank of New York Advisory Council on Small Business and Agriculture, was named to Ebony Magazine's Power 100 list, and has been honored as one of the top 50 women in business in the New Jersey Business um, Journal. Uh, please uh, welcome Adina and thank you as well for being here today. So, you know, we're really excited. I don't, I can't even contain it because you are gonna learn some great information today. Uh, and I really wanna give them both an opportunity to share their stories with you. So Darcel, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to franchising? Thank you, thank you, Nancy. And hello to everyone, all our participants. I'm very excited about participating in this event and I thank uh, Mr. O'Neill for sharing that historical background on how our entrepreneurship journey relates to this Juneteenth holiday. Um, you gave a very good synopsis of my background, so I won't repeat a lot of that, but the highlight is that I came from a long, his, uh, long corporate background. So my background, again, finance, finance and accounting in major Fortune 500 corporations. So I spent the first 25 years of my career in that space, but I always had my mindset on my own business. Um, and I say my own business very loosely because franchising, you know, moving into the franchise world is really a subset of owning your own business. I could have, you know, gone into just a non-franchise style, uh, either acquisition of an existing business or startup and growth of a business. I decided on franchising, just kind of looking at my background, looking at my strengths and weaknesses in particular. Uh, I'm a finance and accounting person, CPA. You know, uh, some people call us um, uh, number crunchers. Uh, and I, I don't think of myself like that. I, I do feel I have more of an overall general business type background. However, I do know my, again, my strengths and weaknesses. And so looking at myself, um, you know, sales and marketing, those are not my strengths. My strengths are digging into the numbers, doing the analysis, looking at the P&Ls. So in terms of, you know, finance and accounting and matching that up with the other side, of the business spectrum, the sales and marketing side, I felt that franchising and in particular, the brand that is associated with being a franchisee would complement me and my business skills. So in other words, the name recognition will help me with respect to being able to uh, get my name out there in the business community, help to grow my business, help to operate my business. And so what I was looking for in terms of a franchise was three things. Number one, a great brand. And so I did not have to then rely just on my skills in terms of being able to market uh, and sell my business. Again, looking at strengths and weaknesses, that is not you know, my area of expertise so much. And so if I had a great brand that sold itself, then that I felt would help me be successful in the business in having my own business. So that was number one, looking for a franchise, looking for a franchise with a great brand. 
Number two, I was looking for something with sustainability. Um, I felt that franchises potentially, and I say potentially very um, you know, strongly, uh, potentially had the ability to sustain economic ups and downs. And this whole pandemic season was an excellent demonstration of what I meant by that in terms of sustainability. And I was looking for a brand that would weather the storm, that was not a fad, uh, something that would kind of come and go. We we all know stories of businesses, franchises that no longer are relevant in these days. I actually looked at some of those back in my earlier days when I was doing due diligence on uh, what type of business I wanted to get into. So sustainability of the brand was the second area. And then the third area, profitability. You were in business to make money. We're not, you know, this is not a nonprofit endeavor. Uh, we're in business to make money. And so profitability, but that was, you know, something that, again, I was very comfortable with how to assess profitability, how to forecast profitability. And so those were the three things that I looked for. And that's what kind of led me into that whole fr franchising space and also led me to actually move forward with the particular franchise that I am uh, now involved with, which is the UPS stores. Great. That's uh, thank you so much, Darcel. That you provided a lot of information there, and and I hear a lot of the same things that I talk to my clients about knowing exactly what it is that they're looking for helps. You don't you don't necessarily need to know everything, but a framework is really great. So, Adina, I want to turn over to you with the same question. Um, tell tell us a little bit about about your background, which I did in your bio, but really, what what led you to franchising? Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Nancy. Thanks. Um... So I think for me, franchising was never something I sought out to do. Um, I really got into franchising as a mechanism to really, as a vehicle to kind of bring accessibility to the community I was living in at the time uh, in Irvington. It was a community I had grew up in. Um, I didn't grow up in it. I worked at a McDonald's when I was a little girl in Irvington. And surprisingly was the first black owner of a McDonald's franchise in the New York Metro area. I worked for him when I was like 12 or 13 years old. And Irvington was this beautiful town. So when I went to college, I started eating at an IHOP next next to my college and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the pancake. I fell in love with the little house, the little decor, which is an amazing thing, you know. So when I came back to Irvington at the, in Newark really, nothing like that existed for me in my community. And when I moved and bought my first house in Irvington, three family, it just got worse because this community that I knew that was so nice and pretty Everybody, all the whites had left. It became a predominantly black community. I think we refer, we refer to that as a white flight. And it was just not the community that I remember. So I wrote a letter to the mayor and I was like, you suck, the town suck. Uh, how come we don't have an IHOP? And you're not expecting anyone to respond back to those letters. You know, now we call the keyboard thugging. You get behind your keyboard and you thug it out. So he actually called me back <laughs> like, yes, I got your letter calling my town suck. I want to have a meeting with you. So we had a meeting and he said to me, as a matter of fact, since you want to IHOP so bad, the diner that you call Jinky in your letter is up for sale. Do you want it? You know, let's go talk to the owner. And I, we went to go talk to the owner. It was this old white Greek guy. And when I walked in, he was just, and the mayor said to him, hey, I have this young lady that want to buy your diner. And he just looked at me like a real disgusting kind of way. It was like her. And that kind of just feel me it was like, this man cannot continue to be in our community. He just got to go. So I remember giving him a deposit out of like sheer emotions. And when I found out I couldn't get my deposit back, I got on this whole bandwagon of trying to be an IHOP franchisee. 
and I was at the time like 24, 25, and I apply. I have turned me down twice. And until, and I'm just the kind of person I don't take no for answer. And when they turned me down, I reached out personally to I have corporate and I spoke to a lady at the time. She was the only black woman at the time working at I have corporate. And I was lucky enough to get on the phone with her and I explained what was happening in Irvington. And she was just really moved by that. And she and I became this journey to bring an IHOP to Irvington. And we were successful. IHOP did approve the franchise. And I think three or four years later, we went on to be the fastest growing IHOP in the whole Northeast. It was just that successful. So that was my initial journey into becoming an IHOP franchisee. Thank you so much. I have to smile a lot because I've had the pleasure of knowing Adina for a couple of years and, and I interviewed her for Black Enterprise and her story always makes me smile. She's such a go-getter. She, like she said, she, she never lets anyone tell her no. And really that's the way to be successful in life. Um, the other thing I love about your two, two stories is they're totally different. And that is honestly what franchising is all about. Franchising a lot of time meets you where you are. You people do it for so many different reasons. And there is a solution. There's a there's an opportunity there for everyone. It's hard to believe. I know we only got about 10 minutes left in our segment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a couple of questions. I know, sure. I know. <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to skip a couple questions because I think what people really want to hear from the two of you is about um your the biggest challenges facing black entrepreneurs today. So whether that's in franchising or in independent, but I want to hear more about that. So Darcel, do you want to uh, share with us what you feel the biggest challenges are today? Yes. Um and I actually want to uh, say that what I'm talk, what I'm going to talk about is not just particular to black uh, franchisees, I think, or black entrepreneurs, but I do feel that it impacts our community um, significantly, at least from my perspective. And that is staffing. Staffing and the whole labor aspect of franchising or of business ownership. Um, this has been exacerbated in recent years during the pandemic. I'm sure we've all, everyone, even on this panel, all on this panel and participants have heard of the mass uh, difficulty across all industries with respect to hiring and retaining staff of all levels, from the retail level that I operate in up to professional levels, turnover, uh, you know, lack of um, you know, availability of, of employees to hire. Uh, so that actually is my biggest challenge, has been my biggest challenge for the 14 years that I've been involved with business ownership. When I did my due diligence back in 2000, let's say 2008, 2009, prior to actually um, getting involved with this UPS store franchise, I did a, uh, you know, just a, a canvas existing owners. And <laughs> Interestingly enough, they were pretty much all white, white men for the most part. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to that. But in any case, um, when I chat, when I interviewed them and asked this exact question, what is the you know challenge, the most challenging thing that you face with respect to being a franchise, particularly in this UPS store uh, network? Staffing, staffing, labor, all of that by far the answer. And as simple as it sounds and as easy as it is to get your head around, um, to this day, 14 years later, that is still my challenge. Um, being able to get great people, being able to get people that fit our customer service um, delivery space, very important you can think of as a consumer you know one thing that you definitely expect when you walk into a business such as mine or any business is excellent customer service to you as a customer uh, not everyone is good at that uh, and I found have had many uh, painful experiences to find that out um, retaining employees so you know turnover is very expensive in a business so retaining employees is, is very costly when you don't have that type of momentum. Um, one thing I want to say on a positive side of this, though, and this is one of the questions maybe you're going to skip, but I do want to mention this. 
Um, in terms of having multi locations, I have day to day managers that are on site. I personally cannot, you know, manage each of those locations day to day. I have the greatest staff of managers in the world. And so I will say that, you know, at some point you do, you are able to develop and grow and retain your staff, but it is very, very, very difficult. And so that today, again, is my, is my biggest challenge. And so um, when I say that it impacts our community, it's the way it is, and, and I can't answer exactly why, but the way it is, most of my staff are African-American. Um, I would say probably 90% of my staff is African-American. And so to the extent that, you know, I can provide uh, employment opportunities to people in my community, um, to the extent that I can pay, you know, as best as I can with respect to my profitability of my business, um, a livable wage, enable them to, uh, you know, provide uh, either for themselves or for their families, or in the case of college students, be able to save money for school, all of these types of things. I've watched some of my employees be able to buy their first car with the job that I've had. I've seen some of my employees be able to purchase property with the job that I have provided to them. And so to the extent that I can provide those opportunities, um, it, it, it is very um, rewarding. Despite right. the change. Right. Despite yeah, the change. I, I I, I suspect Adina would agree with you that staffing is a challenge as well. But Adina, what what would you say um, is the biggest challenge facing uh, Black entrepreneurs today? I think from my lenses, in my view, I think the access to capital is one of the most challenging thing that I see either prevents people from getting into this business or scaling in this business, right? Um, and I'll give you some statistics. You know, the statistics go something like this. About over 60% of Black women in this country are going to start their businesses, be it franchise, be it anything, without the participation of any major bank, right? And I think when you have a group of people that are starting business at the level that Black women and Black people are starting business in this country. To be so systematically locked out of the financial system is in itself, is a deterrent, right? When I went to go open my very first IHOP, a part of that story that I didn't tell you guys was that seven banks, seven banks that all sit in my community that benefits in my community that do business in my community they all said no to me they all said no to me because they hadn't seen an adina before right i was a 25 year old girl looking for a bank to give me 2.5 million dollars in funding to go up in a restaurant that went around, that two, from $2 million went around and created almost 62 jobs, right? They hadn't seen me before. That wasn't a picture that they were comfortable with. But if you duck the surface late, deeper and peel the onions and see what I was at 25 year old, I was overseeing a bank of $100 million. I had real estate out the wazoo. If I was a young white male, that was sitting for that banker, that could have been a possibility. That was something they were comfortable with. But oftentimes, we are not normalized. You know, I said to my friends all the time, the thing a banker fear the most is a black woman or an ambitious black woman, right? And I think I talk to people all the time. We have to advocate. There is this idea of equality that is bothering me so much that we look at everybody in the same lenses in terms of access to capital. And that's why like the advocacy work that I'm doing on my side is no, you have really powerful entrepreneurs out here, but for the lack of capital, they cannot see their dream actualized. 
So for me, I think it's that peace. Yes, ab absolutely. We talk about it all the time. I'm sure Richard's there shaking his head because access to capital is something we work on constantly. Well, unfortunately, we are we are at the end of the time. You guys have so much uh, information to offer. I hope that our audience that have participated um, just sees a little bit of what we're doing here at the Black Franchise Leadership Council. Um, while while we are using this. Um, uh, program to commemorate Juneteenth. We do lots of activities throughout the year, lots of programming that we're here to educate. And again, I really appreciate Adina and Darcel participating, and I hope to be able to moderate a panel uh, at another event soon. Thank you again. Richard? Thank you, Nancy. Um, that was just absolutely powerful. I just have to say, I'm a banker and I love Black women who are ambitious. So come be ambitious with me. Um, I just love that your stories um, that you share and the takeaways, multiple pathways to franchising, no two ways are the same. You both are the example of being the change in your community that you want to see. And you continue to trailblaze despite the obstacle. Um, biggest challenges is staffing and the access to capital. I thought one uh, percentage that was shared, 60% of women start a business without any bank involvement, any major bank involvement. So these are the things that we're working to change. Um, you're now both a part of my network. Um, any access to capital issues, I love to try to break down those barriers on what I do on a regular basis. So now we're going to continue to move forward in our journey through our program. Next up, we're gonna go through um, diversity matters presentation. We're gonna highlight companies that are franchise brands that are taking that next step in their evolution of supporting diverse entrepreneurs and being deliberate, diligent, and committed to the mission and, and making sure that's a part of their values. So today I have Alexandria Reed, She's the Senior Retail Racial Equity and Inclusion Manager at Ben & Jerry's. And she's gonna talk some about the program over there at Ben & Jerry's in which she leads. And we have Devin Mitchell, CEO of DSN Corporation and franchisee of Anytime Fitness and an amazing advocate within a diversity space. So I move and forward this conversation over to Alexandria. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, so I'll just share a little bit about my background and, and my time here at Ben & Jerry's. So we're all about joy and justice. We're ice cream activists at heart. Um, our organization has been on a long journey of equity, inclusion, and belonging. About two years ago, we worked with an external partner to examine the root causes of inequity in our company. We had honest and many times uncomfortable conversations about how those root causes influence our systems, our policies, and our practices. From that work, we determined our key pillars and franchising was one of them. Scoop shops are the heart of Ben & Jerry's. Truly, it's where it all began. And we understand the power of franchising as a wealth building vehicle in the black community. Therefore, we goal ourselves to grow Black ownership from 4% to 20% by the year 2030. Today, we're at 8%. It was also important for us to be honest about the numerous structural barriers which hinder Black people and, of course, other marginalized groups from franchise ownership. Some of these include underrepresentation in home, land, and business ownership, limited access to retirement, inheritance, and liquid assets, lack of wealth, which equates to expensive or inaccessible loans, limited relationships with commercial banks, and lack of franchise ownership experience. Of course, these are immense systemic issues to tackle. There's no perfect solution, but we developed our racial equity incentive program to get us started. This program eliminates franchise fees. It provides three years of royalty waivers for incoming, franchisees or transfers within our system. It eliminates transfer fees. 
It provides payout to sellers. It reimburses up to 3K of training and development fees. And we also work very, very closely with managers who demonstrate the ability to become franchisees. We examine each individual on a case-by-case -case basis to determine how we can better support their journey to entrepreneurship with us. In the future, we are aiming to develop a more comprehensive program, which tackles access to capital and provides a suite of franchisee resources, including mentorship, entrepreneurial education, and leadership development. Thank you so much, Alexandria. I, I, you know, I just have to say, um, I remember when they started, Ben and Jerry started the journey and begin to have this conversation and to see all that you do to create new entrepreneurs, create engagement, your passion when we met out in um, Las Vegas in regards to the mission. Um, thank you for standing at the forefront. Uh, we look forward to a continued partnership with Ben and Jerry's here at the um, IFA Black Franchise Leadership Council. And anything that you need from us, just let us know as well. So thank you for, you know, giving us your treasures, gifts, and these resources that you are creating. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Next, uh, I turn over to my friend, Devon. He, we, we, we've advocated on the Hill together. Uh, we talk entrepreneurship and franchise and diversity over the phone multiple times to, and he is truly passionate um, about this. So I now turn this over to Devon Mitchell. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you panelists for the opportunity to talk to you guys today about franchising um, from the perspective of someone who did, grew up in franchising, know anything about franchising. So before I start, I'll talk to two things. I'll talk about Anytime Fitness, specifically about the leadership and what they've um, been doing around that, and then talk about myself, kind of what, how I show up in that space. Um, specifically around when the murder of George Floyd happened. Um, tragic situation. Anytime Fitness is in Minnesota, Minneapolis, um, actually is in Woodbury. A few, I would say a few months after that, or soon after that, there was a there was a video that was going around the internet that a trainer at an Anytime Fitness created a pro, a training program that was disparaging to the actual murder of George Floyd. And as an owner of Anytime Fitness and Anytime Fitness franchise, that for me was it became for me it was emotional because I was like, wow, this. How could someone do this? And I sat down, penned a letter, and I was like, you know, this is it. I'm done. I am out of the Anytime Fitness game because this is not what I signed up for. And this is really not what Anytime Fitness corporate represents. So before I sent out the letter that says I'm done, my wife said, I think you should read, you should reread your letter. I said, no, I'm not read. So I reread it and I changed it because she says, if you're not there, how are you going to help? If you leave, you can't help. And I said, really? She says, yeah, I think you should read the letter. I think you should rewrite the letter. So I read it, rewrite it, and I sent it off to the leadership team at Anytime Fitness, Chuck Runyon, Dave Mortensen, Stacey Anderson. And what I received back from them, right, was it was impressive to me that they understood, they got it, but they also understood that they didn't have all the answers. Like they were like, just as you're looking at it through your lenses, the lenses that we're looking at it through is how to navigate this um, newfound kind of how to navigate this without we don't have any help. And part of that letter, I said, I want to help, right? Because I have access to more people that look like me that go through my experience than you do. And maybe it's right or wrong, but from my lenses was the conversations that I would have with someone around franchising is a totally different conversation when someone looks at me and says, you're the owner of 
the gym that I go to. You're the owner of this place? And I'm like, yeah. And it a couple of things happens. Folks get excited, but it's not an excitement like, hey, I'm cheering for the black guy. It's the excitement that this guy looks like me, which means I can do this too. And, and that's for me, gives me an opportunity to lean in, right? To lean in on that um, and just really kind of help folks to realize that franchising is an opportunity to not only improve the lives of your family, your community, it's also, it provides also an opportunity for you to gain generational wealth, right? The, you don't, all the work's been done, right? All the, the, the heartache and someone figured it out has been done. Now you get an opportunity to show up and bring your talent, right? So you look at this and say, how do I show up? How can I engage my community? How can I make this better? So you bring your, your talent, your resources, and all the other things that you know to this space and franchising. It doesn't just have to be a gym. It could be anywhere. But going back to any time, so they've put their money um, where their mouth is. And they've said, hey, we want to dive in and we want to help. Um, we started, um, leadership, they started a leadership trying to understand what they can do in growing black owned businesses, women owned, but growing more of the underserved communities within the franchise network. But when you realistically, when you look at it and not just any time fitness, but most other franchises, the space and the areas to grow is black ownership, right? It, the numbers was someone posted a number earlier, but you think about in most of those spaces that you want to get into, when you don't see someone that looks like you, Imagine providing that opportunity to grow for a franchisor that their next growth phase is not a particularly a region, but it's a group of people. It's a group of entrepreneurs that are excited and say, hey, I can do this. I can bring this to my community because folks in our community are leaving to go other places to experience all of those things. I wanted to go to the gym. I left and go to where the gym was. It was, I really didn't care where it was. It was just, that's where the gym's at and you went. So being able to bring those opportunities to the communities that we show up in, that we're from, that we care about, I, for me, it's immense, right? It, and the opportunity that I have here speaking with Richard and, and having conversations with him um, with the International Franchise Association Black Leadership Council was I have an opportunity to affect my community in a positive way to not only inspire young men, um, young men and women to get into, to provide an opportunity for franchise, but I also have an opportunity to provide work, jobs, right? That I never thought that I would, I'm hiring. I don't think that I would be the person that is providing jobs for people and they are going to feed and take care of their family. So for me, Anytime Fitness has allowed that, me that opportunity to do that. And for me, it's making part of my mission that in the communities that I'm from, that I show up in, that folks that look like me, um, that folks are going through any type for me is how do I help create those spaces and programs that folks can look at franchising as another opportunity for them to um, actualize and realize the things that they want to do in life. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. That was um, extremely powerful information from you and also from Alexandria. Um, and I'm going to leave with some closing remarks, but we we'll also have some time here to open for some questions. Um, but first, I'd like to start by giving thanks. And I wanna give thanks to two people that were really instrumental in bringing this collective talent together, planning and prepare for this. So Latanya Pouncey, she's the advisor to the Black Franchise Leadership Council and also a great friend. And we, we came into the Diversity Institute board together 
and she diligently helped craft and put this program together. So I want to give an immense thanks out to her. Uh, for the work and what she does on top of what she does as a CEO of Talent Mix um, on her day-to-day -day job and also what she does as an owner um, in a freight brokering business. Um, and she has multiple years um, as a um, DEI professional for Fortune 500 companies. So thank you for your leadership, um, your organizational skills, and your passion. David Smith, He's the director of diversity programs at the IFA. Um, David has just came in and, and been such an advocate and really that bridge between the Black Franchise Leadership Council and the International Franchise Association. Uh, he brings his gifts. He's an amazing grant writer, um, amazing at organizing and connecting individuals putting together strategies and we're all working together to create some amazing programs. So I, I just really always like to express that thanks because the, without a team, without a group of leaders, and we are all servant leaders volunteering our time outside of what we do on a daily basis, um, it doesn't happen. You, you, you know, you don't move mountains by yourself. You move mountains by many hands. So I thank you for you, you two for that. Um, I just wanted to also end with the one comment here that you are where you are today because you stand on somebody's shoulder. And wherever you are heading, you cannot get there by yourself. If you stand on the shoulder of others, you have a reciprocal responsibility to live your life so that others may stand on your shoulders. It's the quid pro quo life. We exist temporarily through what we take, but we live forever, forever through what we give. So continue to give. And that's a quote by Vernon Jordan. And we have to continue to remember what we give. We can't never operate in the spirit of holding and hoarding. It also always has to be from the spirit of giving. And that's one thing I'm proud of everybody on this group in which we do. So with that closing, um, I hope that you enjoyed this program. I hope that it fed your soul, fed your spirit, inspired you to continue to take the journey to win the race of franchising and entrepreneurship. And now we um, open this up for some questions. Ashley, do we have any questions in the chat? Or we do anybody? not have any at the time. Say it again. We do not have any at this time. Okay, no questions at this time. So I give everybody some of your day back. Um, I thank you for taking this time with us. Have an enjoyable day and uh, always keep the historic struggle of Juneteenth in the top of your mind as you push through and continue to break down those barriers. Thank you and have a blessed day. Thank you.